Welcome to the conversation with the NWSL executives. Uh, my name is Alexa Diaz. I will be moderating this um, conversation. Um, I'm a vice chair at both the women's community and the API community. So um, I will introduce each one of our members before we get into um, our topics for today. Um, we have, um, this is going to be in alphabetical order, so not in sitting order. Um, Haley Carter, um, general manager of OL Pride, or not OL Pride, sorry, Orlando Pride. We don't even have an OLA. I know. <laughs> things changed very quickly on me on, on names. Welcome um, to the league. We have Leslie Gallimer, general manager of Seattle Ray FC now. Um, Mark Kaporian, president of soccer operations and general manager at Washington Spirit. And Lucy Rustin, um, general manager at Bay FC. Um, so we're happy to have all of them here today. So we'll be going into some talk topics about um, coaching and um, involvement in the NWSL. So I am going to start with Lucy. Um, great to have Bay um, FC into the league. And as a new club, um, you have to sign a head coach. So um, can you explain the process in hiring um, a head coach for the club? Yeah, sure. Um, welcome, everybody. Nice to see you all here. Um, so yeah, for us it was a, a unique situation obviously as an expansion team. We had no history, um, we have no players, we have no roster. Um, so when we're bringing in our head coach, I think what became the most important thing for us, for me from day one, was that we knew our identity as a club. Um, we knew what we wanted to be. Um, by that I mean what we wanted our playing style and philosophy to be on the pitch. Um, so the, the way we want to approach the game, the way we want to coach our players, um, the way that we want to build our, uh, an identity for our club. That was the driving force for us in our head coach hire. So we knew that we had to find a head coach who aligned with the identity that we wanted to build from a playing style perspective. And that for us, it, it ruled out coaches and probably 70% of the available coaches um, because we didn't feel like they had that commitment to the playing style that we wanted. And I think for me, speaking to you as, as, as coaches and people who want to get into that world, it's so important that you know how you want to play the game, but you have that commitment to that. Um, because we see a lot of coaches who say, oh, we play football, you know, we want to be possession-based, but that doesn't translate then to the coaching methodology or to the actual commitment to it over a longer period. So for us, when we were interviewing our coaches, it was really all about that. It was about what's your commitment to the playing style that, and the playing ethos that you want and how does that align to us as a club? Because I think we've gone now from the days where clubs used to just hire a coach and let them drive the identity of the, of the playing style in the club. It's the other way around and it should be that way. You should as a club have your, your playing style and your identity nailed on so that you then bring a coach that aligns with that. Because then, you know, as you go through time and you evolve, you bring in players and as a scouting department you're able to recruit specifically for that style. So for us, we, we didn't announce our head coach until September. Um, we have done obviously a lot of work in terms of player recruitment leading up to that. So we were recruiting for players and scouting players knowing the style that eventually our coach would want to play because we were hiring a coach that would fit and align with what we wanted as a club. So I think my advice to, to any coach is to to really know how you want to play the game and commit to that. And it will make you right for some clubs and wrong for other clubs. Um, but that's not a problem it, because that is what is going to allow you to be successful going forwards, is knowing that when you get that opportunity with a club, you're already aligned in terms of your ethoses and your identity. So for us, that was always the most important thing, was finding a coach that aligned with that. Um, Obviously there were other factors that played into it for us, the personality and the human side of it um, was incredibly important, equally as important as the playing style. We needed a coach who was not just a great coach, but a great people and person manager as well. I think that's where coaching has evolved to now, right? I think um, <laughs> probably 50% of the role is actually how you manage people on a day-to-day -day basis. So for us, the personality of the, of the coach was really important as well, um, and their connection with players. Um, I think experience, obviously everyone's going to talk about the experience of the coach and specific to your field, whether, you know, obviously for us it was NWSL, so it's women, it's that level, it's the pro game. How do we find a coach that has experience in those specific markets? For us, we knew that probably 
70 to 80 percent of our roster is probably going to be built from within NWSL so somebody has experience of that particular market for us as an expansion team was very important um, and so I think you know I identifying for yourself as coaches the areas and the, the types of club that that might be appropriate for you to go into is really important when you're thinking about thinking about roles um, in line with experience and where we are as a club, I think, you know, I fast forward maybe five years and is our approach different? No. Um, I think the one thing we probably won't have as much of in the future if, if and when we need to hire a head coach is time. Um, you know, we have a lot of time to, to be able to go through that process. Normally, coaching hires are made in the middle of the season and, you know, the onus is that you need to change results. So I think that process is, is quite quick. I don't think that should and will change my approach to it and my thinking. Um, always, Bay FC and how we want to play the game is is going to have a, a legacy and a way that we want to be forever. It's going to have an identity. So I'll always naturally go to to those profiles. Um, data, I'd say, is really important. Um, my, my career, uh, my background is in data and analytics. Um, so how do I identify those coaches? We use data. Um, it wasn't just, okay, let's draw up a name of people that we know. Um, how do we find the coaches that maybe we're not thinking about? Um, we use data quite significantly in that process as well. So all of it came together and, and when we went through the process, it gave us a short list. I met personally with, with every member um, or every, every coach we're considering. And that to me was, was the really important moment because the relationship between a head coach and a general manager or a sporting director is probably the most important one at a club because you have to be aligned and you have to feel each other and have each other's backs almost. Um, so for me to go and spend time with the head coaches in their natural environments as well um, and see if we got on as human beings because you're going to be spending well, guys, 12 hours a day for 300 days a year like with these people so it's a really tight working relationship and you need to be able to get on as human beings and, and probably believe in similar kind of just lifestyles and like philosophies and morals because that becomes really important as well so for me understanding the coach as a human being and understanding what family they had what how many dogs they had and like what they like doing in their free time and you know we're asking and in most instances you're, instances you'll be asking somebody to uproot their family and maybe move across the other side of the world and so understanding that side of it for them and how are they going to integrate into your market became really important too so um yeah it was a it was a really thorough process for us we we went through that process and, and I think anyone who, who knows the candidate we came out with, it's Albertin Montoya, um, will know that the two things that I've spoken about there, playing style and identity, so I know Bay FC we've spoken a lot about our playing style and identity and Albertin could not be a better coach for that, um, but also him as a human being um, is exactly what we want in a, in a person and, and has the level of care that we expect our coaches to have for their players. Um, I'd say one other significant thing with, with Albertine in particular and with the coaches that we looked at was the ability and proven track record to develop players. I think in NWSL especially, um, you know, we have the draft um, and we, we naturally have a lot of young players coming through the roster. So for us, an ability and a proven track record to develop youth and young talent was really important. Um, and something that Albertine had in abundance as well. So, um, yeah, there are many factors that go into it. For me, the most important one as a, as a coach to reflect on is, like, how committed am I to my playing style and, and, and know and be safe and secure in the feeling that for some clubs that's not going to be right and that's going to rule me out of the job. But that's a positive because for your long-term success, I think, and potential at that club, whatever club you go into, you don't want to go into a club where you're not aligned in terms of the playing style. Um, so be committed to what you believe in, um, be sure in, in how you want to approach and play the game and how you translate that to your coaching sessions. Um, and I think that's something that as a general manager is, is, is something that is really valued and respected. So. Great, thanks Lucy. I'm really excited to see how that all translates like to the field, especially with the, the yeah, staff. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, Haley, um, 
a lot of the coaches out here um, are trying to understand <coughs> and develop, right? Yeah. That's why they're here. So um, one of the challenges is finding development when you're in a working place. So um, what are some ways that um, you know upper management can support those coaches wanting you know additional education during the season? Uh, yeah, it's a great question. So, um, and I'm going to answer it sort of with, with two things. The first, the more immediate direct question on what upper management can do. Um, so, uh, obviously one of the requirements that, that we're pushing in the NWSL is for our head coaches to have pro licenses. Uh, the reality is there has to be a pathway for that because when you're the head coach and you're trying to get through a season and your job is to win and that is your livelihood, having to split that focus with doing a course like a pro license is very, very difficult. It's a very difficult ask. Um, so the first thing is finding the opportunity to get our assistant coaches into a pro course, to get our assistant coaches to make sure they all have their A seniors uh, and, and work through that because their time constraints are a little bit, um, we're all busy. Uh, but the focus allows them, they have a little bit more time to go and, and work on that and invest in that. And with our staff, the way our head coach and assistant coaches divide up the work for one to be pursuing a, a coach education and, and a license at, at a time is, is manageable for us. Um, but we have to find a way to help our head coaches make that time and space, which means we have to invest in them and we have to recognize that if they're going to, to, to make that investment in their time for their development. One, the club is benefiting from them getting their pro license. The club is benefiting from that educational opportunity, but we also have to be willing to give them the space to go and pursue that and recognize that. So if we're, if we're asking them to go get their pro license, but we're not giving them the backing and the support for them to be making that time investment, then that's on us. That's not on them. Uh, and, and I think owning that and recognizing that is, is really important. Uh, the other thing I would say as well is um, I'm not going to go on my soapbox about opening the pro license to coaches right now. It, it is a it's very difficult. I think you just did. I did. <laughs> it's really difficult to get into the pro license. You have to be in the pro game. So if you're a college coach right now, or even if you've coached in the professional game before, if you've coached in the NWSL previously and you don't have your pro license, if you're not currently in the NWSL or USL Super League or, or USL 1 or 2 or any of the pro leagues, you cannot get into the pro license. So you guys can imagine how difficult it is for a coach to continue. Now if we start implementing a requirement that you have to have your pro license to get hired as a head coach, what does that mean? What does my pool now look like of coaches that I could potentially hire as a head coach? So that is the dilemma that we sort of face and, and constant conversations with the league and with US soccer, but ensuring that we are, we are facilitating a true genuine pathway to ensure that we have a large pool of qualified coaching candidates for a head coach position uh, and that we're encouraging them once they get into that position for them to go in and pursue their pro licenses. So yeah, it's a little bit of a soapbox for me. Um, the other thing I would say though is that, and, and this goes to everybody in the room, whether you want to coach in the pro space or not, and I think something that Leslie and Mark will get to is that coaching in the pro space is not for everyone. Um, there are, your job is to win, and if you aren't accomplishing that, you're going to get let go. So you could be out of a job tomorrow, I could be out of a job, Lucy, all of us could be out of a job tomorrow based on our results. Um, so, it, and you guys, I think, following pro leagues on the women's side know how unstable that looks like. Um, so what I would say is, even for college coaches, from a coach education standpoint, make the development investment in yourself, but also use the space to invest in coaches around you. Um, something we've taken really seriously at Orlando Pride is ensuring that we are offering coach education opportunities for the coaches in our community, but also for coaches uh, across the country to be able to come in. We just hosted a, a goalkeeper combine last week, and along those lines, in conjunction with the combine, we hosted a special topics diploma that was facilitated by the United Soccer Coaches sort of goalkeeping lead, Lisa Cole. And we were able to bring our goalkeeper coach in, racing in North Carolina came in, and they were able to present uh, to a group of, of Division I college coaches and high-level high school coaches on what it is that NWSL teams are looking for in goalkeepers. What is our profile for each club? Talked about goalkeeper periodization and what that looks like. Trends in the NWSL, how goals are being scored and how we have to adjust our training sessions 
to ensure that our goalkeepers have the skill set to be able to compete in the league. Um, and what can college coaches do to better prepare their goalkeepers if they want to succeed at the next level, whether it's an NWSL or USL Super League or overseas in Europe, what that looks like. Um, and, and we sort of take that on as, as a moral obligation to, to help bridge that gap between college coaches uh, and even youth coaches now that you're starting to see more youth make that transition directly to skip college and move into the pro game. So um, I, I would say everyone in this room should be thinking about how they can do that same thing in their environment. What, what types of, of courses can you host? Um, what can you do to make the investment in those around you? And so it's not just about your own development, um, but how you can serve others and ensure that they're getting opportunities to develop as well. Thanks, Hayley. Thanks, Haley. Because um, obviously continued edu education is one of the forefront of being a coach and wanting to develop into that next um, level. So segue into to Leslie, um, there's so many different pathways and there's different levels of youth, collegiate, international, professional, and this pathway in specifically women's soccer right now. Um, what is the difference between them? I mean, everyone, like Haley alluded to, is like, it's not for everyone, but what are some of like the key differences of being a coach at those levels and what could like a potential pathway look like for aspiring coaches into the professional level? Yeah, thanks Alexa and welcome everyone. Um, it's great to see everybody here. Uh, Thursday's usually the big kickoff day for the convention. Wednesday for the real go-getters um, and overachievers like Haley. Um, and I wanted to just recognize our international guests that are here. I have been a part in the past of the sports diplomacy program. Uh, raise your hand if you're here on sports diplomacy. Raise your hand. Yes. We have, uh, we have some guests here, I, I believe, from Cameroon and Zambia. Is that correct? Yeah, and it's, it's lovely to see you here at our convention. It makes my heart warm. I've been able to travel um, three different times as a sports envoy for the U.S. Embassy to Ethiopia, uh, Morocco, and a year ago Israel. And it's, uh, it's a program that is really beneficial. And so welcome. It's, it's great to see you here. It's great to see, so you're welcome. It's great to see so many familiar faces. And um, no, I don't remember my question. No, I'm kidding. I do. Uh, so uh, it's just, it's really interesting and great to be up here to listen to Lucy and to Haley and we'll, we'll get to hear from Mark. Um, from my perspective, uh, the pathway. And I coached collegiate soccer for 36 years um, at the Division I level. And uh, the, the pathway question, I, the word pathway kind of, <laughs> if I've heard it once, I've heard it 7,000 times. Uh, the best way to talk about a pathway when it comes to a player pathway and a coaching pathway is that it's unique to everyone. It's, it's absolutely unique and there isn't one pathway. It is not linear, it is not the same, it is not, there's nothing about it that I can sit up here and script to you that is the way to go. I'm sitting next to three uh, outstanding people who each have become general managers or sporting directors of women's professional clubs, myself included only six months ago, um, through different pathways. And it, it's, it's you. It's you and what your ambitions and what your goals are and how you put yourself in a position in your career. Um, I wouldn't even to say achieve what you want, but just to continue moving forward in, in the game as opportunities present themselves and then to make a decision if that's something that you feel suits you. And more importantly, that someone else sees in you that they think you would excel in. Um, I, you know, I, I tell people this all the time, now having been around, um, Seattle Rain FC, <laughs> Seattle Rain FC, the entire time they've been in the league because I've lived in Seattle for 30 years, it's where I was coaching collegiately until I left in 2019, uh, is that now being on the inside for six months, one of the things in my own pathway that I look at, and Mark had the opportunity to go from being a college coach to being a professional coach in the first iteration, was it the first or the second, the first, first. iteration of our pro league in this country, um, and then he went back to collegiate coaching is that I, I was a little tiny part of me that's like, oh, wow, I should have maybe coached as a professional at some point in time. I maybe should have taken the leap. Part of that in my pathway was really not the desire to move, <laughs> to be fair. You want to be a professional coach, you better be ready to pick up and go wherever. Um, doesn't mean you have to, but your opportunities are going to shrink if you're not willing to. As an assistant, as a head coach, as anybody involved in the professional game, um, that would be one thing. And the second thing would be 
that uh, you have to be willing to throw your neck out there because it could, it could be <laughs> short-lived. Um, and we've seen it in our league over this last year. And this isn't to call anyone out. This is the thing as a long time college coach, one of the handful that was fortunate enough to be at one place for 26 years. And there are a few of us out there. Um, I, I didn't really ever, I, I would say I got comfortable, but I just, I didn't realize like you, you get this like fear of, of failure, meaning you get sacked. I managed to get sacked in football every week, internationally, um, professionally. And so we, you know, Scott Parkinson is an assistant coach on our staff and, and he was at Gotham for a very short time. Circumstances, it's not a, it's not a, it's winning and losing, it's competition, it's fit, it's changes, it's all these things. So you have to be willing to go into an environment even as assistant where, <laughs> you know, something, manager, uh, ownership changes, something, one thing in the club tweaks, you don't have the results and it's, but it's really, really cool at the same time. It's, it's exhilarating, it's high level athletes, it's high level professionals, it's a, it, the project around building a, a great professional team and club is really, really cool. So um, I'll go back to saying that your pathway is one that you make. And I think there's so many great examples out there. Mark is one, Haley, Lucy. Um, if you were to do research or if you already know about the three of them, their pathways are unbelievable. Um, I'll give you some examples outside of here. Uh, Melissa Phillips is a great example. Um, American woman who went over and coached in England and came back and went to Angel City and now she's coaching at Brighton. Um, and I, I bet there's not many people, and I, we all, we're referring to women a lot and we are our GMs in a women's league, but there are men that have similar pathways is they just put themselves out there to go and do it without fanfare because it's what they love and what, what their passion is. Um, I would say it's the same for the international game. You look at Randy Waldrum. That guy, he's something, <laughs> right? He, I mean, this, this guy has done a ridiculous job at almost every college program he's been at. He, which college, extremely stable, Mark and I will tell you, from a benefit standpoint, from a livelihood standpoint. Um, if you do a decent job, odds are it's, it's a little less risky than going and being a professional or a national team coach. Uh, but Randy has obviously had a, um, a desire to go and try to be successful in federations and with countries, Trinidad and Tobago, um, Nigeria, where he feels like he can help impact the game in a positive way globally, and to do that while still doing his college job. So there's another, you know, pathway. Would Randy, well, he did. He, he also coached professionally in our league, so. He coached me. He did, he coached Haley. And a biggest feather in his cap. Yeah, so there's, I mean, everyone, uh, everyone has their, their, their own way. Lisa Cole, where is she? Is she in here? She usually shows, oh, there she is. Um, you know, Lisa's been with Papua New Guinea, Zambia, Antigua, Barbo, uh, Barbado, and uh, Fiji. Yeah, I can't keep track of Lisa. She throws her out, herself out there literally on a raft into the middle of the Caribbean and just whatever <laughs> island she hits, she coaches. Um, so, uh, but, but Lisa is someone, and she's also been in, in the Women's Professional League, but the, it, again, and obviously willing to either couch surf or move or pick up her life and do it some, somewhere else. So there's, there is no linear way to do it. I think that um, like players, coaches, need to always put themselves in a position where they're learning and they're developing. And in the college game, and I know that sounds a little bit trite or you know whatever, cliche, but I, I, I really feel as though when you're choosing where to put yourself and you do have to look at it as a choice, is that you, uh, you put yourself in a position to learn, grow, and be willing to fail. Um, and, and, and that means um, through feedback that you get for the people that you're working with and that are mentoring you, you have to be able to take critical feedback. You have to be able to be in a situation and decide, mm, my personality, I thought this was gonna be awesome, but I don't align with this person's vision or the way that they do things. I should probably remove myself. <laughs> um, it, it doesn't mean that it has to go south. Maybe there is a way that through your own leadership, if you're not the head coach, that you um, make inroads to have an impact in a way that does suit your personality, but you have to also be willing to call it quits when you know it doesn't align with who you are. You can't be disingenuine ever, in my opinion, and get where you want to go successfully. That's how I feel. Um, I think it's just, it, it becomes so apparent to the people that matter most who are players. When you, when you cave and you become someone that you're not in the coaching world, it's, it's the easiest thing to see, in my opinion. Um, so from, from a, I think Haley touched on the licensing piece, 
Um, and she, you know, the, the really important piece of giving back uh, to the game as a pro club, and I can only hope in the next year, well, if I, however long I last, um, that I can get to that point because I am a big, uh, You're almost there. I, I'm a big believer uh, in, in continuing education in every way, shape, and form. Um, and, you know, whether you're a college coach, a high school coach, a club coach, a club commissioner, uh, a GM of a club, there's always a place where you can be teaching and providing opportunities for others to grow. And that doesn't, isn't just from a coaching standpoint, that's your entire staff, the entire technical <coughs> staff. Every medical person, every high performance person, everyone in your club um, at the professional level should have a means to professionally develop and continue to improve and leave your club if there's something better out there for them. But your job is to, to, to foster that within your environment. I'm a, I'm a huge believer in that. Um, I would say, uh, just lastly, on the, on the coaching piece and, you know, pathway to the pro, if you will, is, uh, is it's so cool in this country to see our league in particular where it is and the improvements, the investments. Look at who this guy just hired. <laughs> come on. Good job, by the way, Lucy. But also, Mark, come on. Um, so, uh, so I think that the opportunities that are out there and the ability uh, for our game to continue to excel and to improve and to actually be professional. <laughs> I think you can say professional, for it, but for it to actually be professional, uh, you have to hire and, and, and train and teach and align with people whose behaviors are professional, whose level of understanding of the game and the way they operate is professional, the way they uh, manage their players is professional. Uh, is is really really cool to see if you look across our league starting next season with the 14 teams that we'll have and you look at every single head coach and you do a study on each one of them there's not one of them that's the same I mean they're just not even close in their pathway and, and how they've gotten to where they are and what they've experienced um, there could be some similarities and a little bit of crossover but if you want to get to that level um, you know, data analytics, um, being really good behind the scenes, up the, you know, the eye in the sky, uh, being the person that is a specialist. Just if you're a specialist on the field as a player, as a coach, if you're a specialist with set pieces, if you're the goalkeeping guru, but also can do other things within the coaching staff that make you unique, those are all things that are going to make you valuable to a staff. Um, but like I said, I think that the thing in our game right now uh, is is not just the desire, but it's also the ability to look and learn and find out the types, who you are first and foremost, but who you align with to get yourself to where you want to go. Um, but there has to be a lot of willingness to fail and to throw yourself out there, for sure. Awesome. Thanks, Leslie. Uh, it's really, really helpful in understanding those different pathways. Um, so we've talked about coach development and things like that, but obviously one of the main focuses is player development. Um, that's what you're doing at any single level. Um, so Mark, um, you know, coming from those different levels of the game that you've been in so many years, um, how important is, you know, player development at each level? Yeah, I think that um, for me it's a really important part of it. I'm going to start off by asking a question though. Um, how many of you are coaching um, players that are um, younger than high school age? So many of you. And uh, how many of you are coaching the high school age, between high school, but not yet in college? Okay, and how about college? Okay, so we have more younger uh, coaches, uh, more, more coaches coaching younger people. Um, the idea of development is really important to me. It's always been important to me. Um, a, a little bit of background. My background is that I was a high school teacher when I graduated from college, a seven-year high school teacher. Um, my master's degree is in education and learning styles. So trying to connect and trying to find ways to help players because every player is different. All of us learn differently. All of us have a different uh, um, capacity to grow. And, and the way that we treat our players oftentimes will, will really help to form and shape whether they'll become successful or not. And I know for me, when I was a young, a young kid playing, I had different coaches. And back in my, my generation, well, those coaches weren't, um, they, they weren't shy about yelling at you. They weren't shy about uh, swearing at you. They weren't shy about letting you know that uh, uh, you were oftentimes a, a pretty low form of, of life. But uh, 
you know, times have changed today and certainly for the better. But I think my point to you is recognizing that every player has a capacity for growth. You're, you're going to have kids in your team, whether again it's college kids or it's young kids, um, that are going to be late bloomers. Uh, one, of the, one of the most interesting experiences I've had as a coach was I had the chance to coach our U19 national team. And one of the things that became real apparent to me was some of these young, young women I coached, were, they were absolutely fantastic players at 18 years old. But you know, they never made it to the senior national team. And there were players that for us, we looked at and we were able to, to help and help shape them that became big stars on the global stage. Some were identified before, some weren't identified before. So my point to you is that recognizing that all of these kids will have a different background. They're just like Leslie spoke about with all of us having a different background. We, we've all gone down a different path. I grew up in New Hampshire. There aren't a whole lot of people from New Hampshire in the world of soccer that have had an opportunity to uh, to be a, a college coach or a professional coach um, or a GM at this level up to this point. And my hope is that there'll be more and more from New Hampshire or Maine or, or those areas. But I guess my point to you is that recognizing that every player has a capacity to develop, it, uh, to develop is really important. One of the challenges we have in our country is balancing how important is winning versus development. And for me, that's an area of, of great struggle because I do think that oftentimes we are sacrificing player development for results. And at the end of the day, for all of us, for all of our coaches as well, they're looking and they, well, it's a results driven business. You didn't win and you're going to be out the door or you get bonus um, money that's related to um, wins or championships or, 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 or overall results or whatever it may be. So it is a results driven business, but my hope is that we can get to a point where we're looking and saying, we're going to focus on the individual development of these, these folks. So Lucy, Lucy spoke about her coach, Albertine Montoya. Uh, Albertine, I love the guy. I absolutely love him. He is one of the best youth coaches I've seen. I liked him as, enough so that I brought him into uh, Washington um, to be an interim coach for us a little while, and I was thrilled when they hired him. I certainly don't want to compete against him, <laughs> but what I can tell you is there will be development going on at their team. And for me, that's huge. When I look at our U.S. national team, and I think about, well, where are we in, in the world scheme? How are we doing uh, comparatively? We didn't have a good World Cup. I don't think anyone would talk about uh, great results or great play in the World Cup, but I think it falls on all of us. And all of you in the crowd as well as all of us on the stage, that we need to re-examine how it is that we're doing this, because if we don't go back to doing the fundamentals, and again, as many of you know, I had really good players at Florida State. But many of those really good players came in as good players and they had the right work ethic and they had the right mentality and they had the world, right drive. And I had the right staff to help those kids grow. What I'm sure of is that in that team, they're gonna have the exact same thing. But what about for you and your team? Are you willing to take that extra time to help that player to develop rather than just think, well, we're just gonna smash the ball forward, we got a bigger kid than everybody else, they're gonna flick the ball on, we're gonna run behind and they're gonna smack the ball and, well, if the, the numbers are there, we're gonna win more games than we lose. But my hope and my passion and my dream is that we can continue to grow the development in the game because Spain sure did it, right? I mean, for all of us sitting on the stage, it was no surprise to see the quality of which Spain played and the quality that Japan played. And what was a surprise though was to see how good Colombia was and some of the African nations and, and many of these other countries that, well, maybe they haven't, they haven't been recognized as uh, uh, global uh, powerhouses in the past, but now they are. So it's really good for the game. But I think that when we're talking about our country and in the development here, I think it all comes right back to us and it all falls on us of how much are we willing to sacrifice 
and help these players to actually grow and develop. And I know everybody has different resources. Some of you may or may not be able to videotape uh, your games. You, you may not have that capacity, but if you do, can there be some sort of an analysis with them? Is there the opportunity for individual um, you know, uh, performance development, strength and conditioning, or whatever it is? But, I mean, we have a beautiful country, we have a big country, we have a lot of players playing and a lot of, uh, a lot of great coaches out there. If we can really focus on this development piece, I think the future will become quite bright for us as we go forward. But, um, yeah, for me, it, it is all about development. When we're drafting these young players coming out of college, when we're taking uh, a younger player, it's with the intent that we're going to make them better. We need to help them realize the opportunity to become a national team player. They may never make it, but that has to be part of the goal. It has to be part of the dream. It has to be part of our focus in helping them to re reach the highest level that they can reach. Great, Mark. I'm just going to follow up on that last part because there's so many people here in the youth space. We've seen so many young players make that jump from the youth club game into professional. Like, how do you know that those players are even ready for this professional level? Or being a youth coach, how to know, like, hey, this player is special. Take a look at them. Like, how does that process work? Yeah, I think if there are gaps that you're not disclosing when we're asking the questions, that's only going to come back to hurt that player. And I think making sure that uh, whatever it is that you're seeing and holding them accountable and, and being direct with them is, is really important for them. It's a huge leap. For me, uh, certainly Leslie as well, and I'm sure for, for uh, all of us on the stage, we all really value education. We all think that the universities and the education, we, we think that that's a wonderful system that we have here. But now things have changed a little bit in our country and now we're starting to tweak things and some kids are bypassing their university ed education to come into the pro league. My hope is that we'll all look at this in a sensible manner and make sure that we're taking the right kids. And part of that is knowing far more than just their technical quality or their athletic quality. It's understanding their maturity level. For me, the biggest shame will be is if we throw these kids' education away. They decide at 17 they're going to come into the league, they can come into the league, two years later they're out of the league and they're not playing. Either we burnt them out or they weren't ready and uh, either we made mistakes or their parents made mistakes. I think all of you probably know the parents can be uh, a little bit um, pushy and you know, this kid's gone as a pro, so you're as good as she is, or you're better than her, so you should go, and so on. Uh, try not to fall into that trap. The kids deserve better. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. Um, so at this time, um, we'll like to open it up um, to all of you to ask um, some questions to any of them um, in specific. Obviously, they'll probably answer a little bit more general than other specific areas, but um, if you have any questions, just kind of raise your hand. I'll come around. Just um, state your name, level you. Coach. I like a little game show. Like um, honestly, I think this is my new calling: <laughs> is to just walk around with the mic and just talk to people. So, free agent, free agent on the market. My name is Malik Demusa. I'm with Austin Soul FC, um, and my question is really about the failure part. Uh, I believe it was Leslie or Lucy, I believe, spoke about not being linear in development, be it a coach or a player. So I'm trying to understand more <clears throat> about the failure part. If you're a professional coach and you're trying to get your education and trying to move forward and you're failing maybe at that, how are you supporting them to be able to accomplish those goals of being able to move up in education or whatever? licensing or whatever they're trying to do because it's not easy obviously at the professional ranks or even at the collegiate ranks to be able to do both to be able to continue with your program and at the same time further your education i love when my name is associated with failure so thanks for the question <laughs> it hasn't happened often yeah thanks um so uh, i think what i what i kind of hear you asking is I'll, I'll speak from the position we're all in right now, which is, is man, general managers or sporting directors of our clubs. And I will also look back at my collegiate career or any time I've been in a, a leadership position where um, I'm charged with helping develop people. 
And I think it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't really matter the realm you're in. I always feel that that's part of your responsibility if you are the manager of others, whether it's players or, or coaches, is that you have to set them up for success and they have to be willing to fail and you have to be willing to see them through their failure is probably the best way I could describe it. Um, if, you know, I think we always go back to, you know, coaching licenses, professional development, those are formal things. I think it's the day-to-day. -day. I think it's the day-to-day -day of paying attention to how people are performing their jobs. So if it's the head coach, the assistant coach, the goalkeeper coach, um, whoever it is on your staff, is that you have to be willing, like, all the time. It's exhausting. It's the most tiring part of being a good leader, in my opinion, is being consistent in the constant critical feedback that you're giving others. It doesn't mean you're always sitting down, closing the door to your office and screaming at someone, or ever. Um, it means that you're just giving them feedback in, in small doses all the time, and that becomes the normalized behavior of, oh, okay, I see what you're saying there. If it has to do, I'll give you an example with um, me, you know, recognizing that a situation took place where a player that was then probably not living up to the standard of what I would say was okay in the club, but then started the next game, um, even at the professional level. I would say something to the coach or at least ask the question, just what was your thinking when she ended up in the starting 11? Because what I saw all week was, if I'm a player, uh, that's gonna be something that I'm, I'm looking at you and then you know the, the questions start in your head or assumptions start about what's okay, what's not okay. And, and if that it doesn't, isn't brought up, then you're normalizing a behavior that maybe you don't agree with and then that's on you to not have the discussion around it. Uh, but I, I think, and, you know, if you go to the formal education part where Haley alluded to, um, and, and as a coach educator myself that understands what the rigor is of having to be in a course and what the, the coursework work looks like, is it is meant to be, and I'm going to semi-defend U.S. soccer, which isn't my normal case, but mm -hmm. I'll, I'll defend them and say that coaching education who, you know, it, it has absolutely evolved over the years, is it is meant to be experiential, meaning that the licenses are set up so that in your environment, whether you're an assistant, which I agree with Haley, or someone that aspires or has access to, um, I'll give you an example. Amy Griffin is the executive director of our academy at Rain. She's been a college coach for 30 something years. She's coached every level. She's the head coach of the youth national team. She's been a, she's been a champion at every level. There's no reason Amy shouldn't be able to, because she's attached to our first team, to take the pro license, in my opinion. She has access to the pro environment. So I'll just throw that out there. Um, she could teach most of the people that are going into the pro license. She should be accepted into the pro license. So That's a soapbox. Soapbox. So I'll go back and say that as a general manager or someone that has someone in their environment that's doing something like that, you have to support them through it. And, and I think in coaching education, to be fair, is the, the instructors are also, it's experiential. You're living your life, you know, in the things that you're doing and getting critical feedback on how you do them to help you improve. And it really, it's taxing because it's, you're doing a course, but it, and as general managers, we have to support them in that work. And the instructors also are very supportive. It's like, okay you're on a three game skid, uh, here's what I'm not gonna do. Like get into you right now about turning in an assignment. That's, just, that's not the way it works. But the people that are responsible for those coaches have to also manage that for them and help them, help them through it or else you are setting them up for, for failure, unnecessarily in my opinion. Um, I don't know if that answers your question at all. I could, as you can see, go on for days. So I'll just throw this Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I'm so impressed with the knowledge I am acquiring here. I'm a former victory from Cameroon for the diplomacy program. It's such an enriching opportunity to have to network and exchange ideas. After having listened to all of you clearly, I have this worries these questions. Talking about development, player or coach development, I want to find out if player coach development is linked only to a team or is it national conception? Is it linked to the national team? That is the top 
level for success for the country, leading to the clubs, to the college, and all it's limited only to the club. Or is there a pathway for them to be linked together so that the country has an identity? Secondly, another question goes to the recruitment. I want to know if recruitment of the players come before the coaches or the managers concern more with identifying who the team wants before getting to recruit the coach that will use those players. That's a great question. Thank you so much. I'll start. I'll start. Go. Um, so to answer your first question, uh, I'm just going to answer it within the context of our club. So we are in communication with U.S. Soccer. Our, our coaching staff is in communication with U.S. Soccer and their coaching staff at the national team level in terms of what they're looking for for certain players. The reality is they have provisional rosters and players that they've identified that they would like to develop into potential national team players, and they have an idea of how they want them to play. So they would give us feedback on what they're looking for. But regardless, because that means that not everybody on our roster is potentially included in that. Um, and that goes for multiple federations. So we have, I don't know if you guys know this, but I've got like half the Brazilian women's national team on our roster right now. Um, and we have a very good relationship with them as well in terms of what they're looking for for their players. Um, we have a couple Canadians and we have a good relationship with them. And so we get feedback from them. So. Um, but what we, and I believe this is true of all of our clubs, have individual development plans for each of our players that are player driven. And so they get to assess their skills and attributes that we've identified will make them successful at the pro game. They get to assess it. Uh, we have a conversation with them to make sure that we're on the same page, that what they think their strengths are and what they think their weaknesses are are somewhat aligned with what we see as a staff. Uh, and then they set their own goals and what they're looking for in terms of how they want to play. We all know like smart goals, right? Things that are, are attainable for them that they can measure. And then we'll check in with them throughout the season and it's player driven. So you have some players, especially younger players that will want to come in, they'll want to do video, they'll want to talk about their development plan more often than some of our, our more experienced pros. Like Marta, Marta is not interested in sitting down with you every month to talk about her individual development. Um, so it, it's, it's very specific to the athletes, uh, and to answer your question, if they're, if they're on the radar of the U.S. Women's National Team or any of the international national teams, we will have conversations with our technical staff and their teams, and not just their technical people, but also their medical people, their performance people, anybody that might influence or have uh, a relationship with that athlete will be involved in those conversations. So that's the... the first answer and then the second answer just from my club and, and I'll pass it around is uh, we have a DNA and an identity that we've developed at our club in terms of how we want to play I don't know if you guys are familiar with the English FA they came up with the DNA document a few years ago and it's for me I, I like to use that uh, sort of framework because it's really straightforward so how we play how we coach how we train how we scout and how we recruit um, we have a, a an identity in the DNA of what we want and how we want to play. And we have a coach that was hired actually before I was hired. He was he was he went from being the interim head coach to being the full head coach. Um, but he and I are very aligned on how we want to play. When we recruit and, and scout, we scout players and then we recruit them, it's still very much about bringing them into our environment. Um, we're looking at players who are going to fit into that DNA and identity. So. If our head coach is to leave tomorrow or something's to happen, we still are going to play according to that identity. Um, and to Lucy's point, you're going to recruit a coach that's going to fit into your club identity. Because if you're changing your identity, you're changing how you want to play, you're changing your methodology and your philosophy as a club every time you have a coaching change, it is a revolving door. You're never going to have any consistency or DNA. Uh, and so that's something that we prioritize in establishing that you know, we know how we want to play and we will go and find players that will play within that system. Crushed it. Thank you. Crushed it. It's great. Thank you to everyone on the panel. My name is Mike Giacolucci. I'm an executive director of a club, Oregon Premier. Um, my question is for you, Lucy. You mentioned the importance of commitment 
of your coaches to your club identity, what metrics do you use or can you use to measure coaches' commitment to that identity? In the youth game, you know, obviously I have 67 paid coaches on staff and it's a challenge IDP-wise and development-wise, let alone the club identity and the style of play. I'm just curious at the pro level, what metrics you use throughout the season to check in and see if the, the play style and the commitment to that identity and philosophy is there throughout the coaching staff? Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, obviously at the pro level, it's slightly different. We have access to a whole host of data resources as well that we can tap into. Um, so we do, we use um, various KPIs which we'll set with our head coach um, at the start of the season as to what we think are relevant and most aligned to, to what that style of play and vision is. Um, that needs to be driven by the head coach as well. They need to understand that so that, you know, six games in, if those KPIs aren't where we need to be, you know, there was buying at the start. So there are various metri metrics like, I'm sure you've seen a lot of Opta data and stats from data and the, the KPIs you can get from that. There are much more complex data points we can get from that as well now with physical data thrown in. Um, and we, we do, we combine all of those to come up with our, our own metrics as, as you were as a club um, as to, to what's important and what measures success far beyond just winning losses and draws. Um, I, I would say that data is fantastic. Like I say my background is in data so I'm a big champion of it. It only ever tells you so much. Um, it only ever tells you half the story. It doesn't tell you that player was sent off after five minutes, it doesn't tell you that you've had six injuries and have had to change your roster around, it doesn't tell you three players were ill that week. And so actually I think what comes as the bigger piece of it is actually the, the subjective of how we sit down and evaluate our performance um, subjectively when we watch games but also when we watch training sessions. Because as I said earlier, there'll be we'll, we'll have a playing style and philosophy but there needs to be a methodology behind getting there. There needs to be, okay, this is why we're going to train and periodise our training schedule in this way because we think it's going to get us to where we want to be on the pitch in terms of our playing style and philosophy. So when we're evaluating and as a general manager, we're looking at our head coach and taking away the results, I think it's really important to look at the day-to-day. -day. Um, it's looking at how we're training and how we're coaching and how that aligns to our methodologies and our principles. Um, and if we're implementing those things on the, on the training pitch every day. And that can be the, the, the reason why, okay, we may not be getting results, but actually our performances we're happy with. And we've seen development and we've seen it on the training pitch. Or it could be, I've been in many situations where, shit, the players turn up every day in training and we, we know we're training well, but come game day, it's not coming together. You fall back on the, the day-to-days and how we're managing the group in that sense to actually assess the coach in that way and I think that's that's better leadership than then going we've lost our last five games like you have to take it beyond that and actually see the day-to-days of it as well um, so there's a real combination of and that, that brings in as well the medical and performance staff like so you look at you look at your injuries and why are we getting these injuries you look at your training loads and you look at the periodization and the micro cycles and the macro cycles how does that align with what we're trying to achieve because there's a whole load of science now about training methodologies and, and coaching styles and the style of play that you're actually alluding to. So for us, it's much bigger than going, okay, how many, what was our average number of passes per game? How many final third entries did we make and how many crosses did we deliver? Um, it's actually that bigger piece of actually going right subjectively, what am I seeing on a day-to-day -day basis? And then as, as Hayley was talking about, open communication. Open communication is about sitting down and discussing the whys, the whys and whats, like what are you thinking, why, why did you do that, um, how could we have done things differently, um, and it's, it's being inquisitive um, to make sure that you're, you keep that alignment. Um, because I think, say, when you go through a season and you go through the ups and downs and everything, it, it's, it can be easy for a coach to get distracted by results. Our job is actually to pull them back into the methodology and pull them back into the identity piece. So for us, it's, it's or for me especially, it's very subjective. It's about making sure you're present to have an overview of everything that's going on day to day and then using data as well to, to supplement that when we can.
Great, awesome. I think we have time for one more. If anyone else wants to chime in on that one. Uh, one more question would be good. To follow up on that question, but I have one more right here. We would like to hear from Vanessa. Hello, everyone. Hi, Vanessa. Uh, my name is Vanessa Martinez. I coach uh, at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg, uh, Canada, and also a CONCACAF educator. Uh, my question for you is, we know that we're doing really well in terms of participation numbers in, in the player side. Uh, the, the numbers are increasing exponentially since many years ago. On the other side, on the coaching side and in other roles in, in our game, the number of females involved in those roles are still very limited. Uh, my question for you is if, if in the NWSL league or in your specific clubs, are there any strategies that you are taking to help uh, in that area to increase the number of coaches, female coaches especially, in educating them, in uh, uh, recruiting them, and also retaining them uh, to help with that big gap that we still have? Um, in many countries, um, even here, there are still many girls that don't see a female coach, and it's very hard to become one when you don't see one. Um, so my question is, if you have any specific programs or any specific strategies helping in that area? Um, the one thing that I've learned is that women have to feel invited to opportunities. Who is a woman in here who has ever been asked by a man who is hiring a, a coaching position or said, well, I put the application out there and no women applied? Who's heard that? Who's ever been asked by a man coach, a male coach, well, where are all the women coaches? Right? Women need to feel invited. Something that we are notorious for, and I understand that it's a sweeping generalization, and if you don't feel this way, God bless you, I admire you, that's amazing. If we don't meet 10 of 10 qualifications, we will not apply for a position. We could meet 8 of 10 and think, oh, well, I don't, I don't hit those two qualifications, so I'm not going to put my application in. Whereas there are other coaches that we know who could have two of the qualifications, and they're going to throw their name into that because they're just that confident. We have to, something that we've implemented, Vanessa, and, and it's just because I've lived that experience, is going out and looking for women coaches. And when we make hires, if you look at my staff, our technical staff is the most diverse staff in the league, hands down. And it, it's not because we went and made token hires. It's because we went and identified the best coaches who are of a diverse background, who are deserving of an opportunity. But we made an effort. Yolanda Thomas, one of our assistant coaches, she is one of the best coaches in the country, period. And she's, she's worked at the youth space, she's worked in WPSL, she's coached in college. It was time for her to have an opportunity and we went and sought her out to get her in and we're incredibly fortunate to be able to do that. But it's on us as hiring managers and it's on everybody in this room and that's not just true of women, it's true of all minorities to go and find them because they are out there. It's not, it, it requires active work. It's not just something you can passively hope is going to happen. It, all of us play a role in that, and it has to be an active search and a diligent search, and we can't be lazy about it. We have to be very serious about it. It has to require sort of a systemic change in our processes and procedures so that any time we're looking at hiring a position, we are ensuring that we are going out and we are asking people who we think are qualified to, to apply because we need to feel invited to it because we almost, so many of us aren't gonna apply for a position unless somebody reaches out to us and gives us that encouragement and says, no, you are qualified to do that. Put your name in the hat. What's the worst that can happen? Um, so I'm, I'm really passionate about it and really serious about it because I've just lived that experience. Where, where are the women? Well, they're sitting in this room. We're right here. I would like to hear your passion a little more. <laughs> I'm going to spare everyone the time. I'll be the social this evening now if anybody would like to hear more. And after two drinks, you are after going. After, after two drinks. Yeah. That's, that's all it takes these days. <laughs> so there is one thing I want to say. Yeah. So there is one other thing off topic. Uh, Haley addressed that. I don't need to speak to, to that any further. The success and growth of the league starts with all of you folks as well. So we need for you to bring your kids to, to the games and we need you to watch the games on whatever social medium it is that it's presented on and 
and that will help to grow the game. It will get more money into the game. It will get more sponsorship into the game. So um, for those of you that are college coaches and you put your kids into the NWSL, thank you for that. If you had helped these kids early on in their pathway, take great pride in that as well. But the NWSL and the MLS need you and your support. So whatever it is that you can do to support uh, professional soccer in this country, please do so. That's a great way to wrap this all up, Mark. Thank you so much. So thank you all for all of your questions. Thank you to our panel. Uh, uh, since this is part of the Women's Diploma, you can um, go out and get validations for this uh, from the Women's Diploma for attending this meeting. Um, one thing that I know for sure from this group of people is that they are always willing to talk with you. So um, obviously if you see them around, chat with them, they're some of the greatest people I've ever met um, and very good friends with all of them. So thank you all so much for being here and enjoy the convention.